I really do uh, get a kick out of every year around Dr. King's birthday, uh, the federal holiday, and we get treated with all the quotes and all the laudatory comments about how amazing Dr. King was and what he stood for and what he did for America. And then the same folk then turn around and literally vote against, speak against the very things that he actually fought for. And so uh, uh, Sunday night, I had some followers of mine who sent me uh, a sermon uh, by uh, Houston's uh, Ed Young Sr., uh, who leads Second Baptist Church. And Ed Young is one of the most prominent white conservative preachers in the country. Uh, Second Baptist has several locations uh, in Houston. Uh, his son has a massive church in North Texas, and, uh, and he's one of the biggest voices uh, among uh, the uh, conservative uh, Christian movement. And uh, he lately he has been highly critical of uh, progressive policies and the left and criticizing, uh, saying, lying about Houston saying Houston has the highest crime rate out of, uh, in the country. That was a lie. Uh, telling folks we should be we should be opposing cash bail. I mean, all kind of BS from the pulpit, uh, constantly lying. He's been checked by Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner on several occasions as well. Uh, but, but, but he gave a sermon called Created Equal, and I, I listened to it, and I had to get a laugh out of it as I, as I watched him go through it uh, and, and with the praise of Dr. King. And so I, I just wanted to just begin to break this thing down. So, so why don't you go ahead and, and play it, and I'm going to start it and stop it and walk you all through uh, some of the nonsense that we heard from him that we often hear from other white conservative preachers who make the same mistake in terms of trying to look all good with racial reconciliation and speaking against racism. But it's amazing how they ignore a lot of other stuff that happens. But go ahead, let's start it right now. Yesterday I went back and I looked at 400 years of life in America for the African-American who was brought over here as slaves. I, you know, I sort of knew all that, but I didn't have any concept of the length of the bigotry, the prejudice, Get ready, stop it. the inhumane way Americans treated fellow human beings made in the image of God, because if you know your history, uh, slaves first came over here in, in 1619, and I do not buy the 1619 phony history. That's not what I'm saying, but they came. Stop right there, stop right there, stop right there. First of all, Ed Young, y'all, was 86 years old. He was born in Mississippi. He pastored in South Carolina. How in the hell are you unaware of the treatment of African Americans in the United States? You were born and raised in Mississippi. Uh, really? Now, now y'all notice right there how he mentioned the first slaves coming in 1619, and then I don't mean that phony 1619 history project. Notice how he slid that in, okay? See, th th this is what they do. See, their anger is at Nicole Hannah-Jones and all the other folks who participated in that because what folk like Ed Young don't like is the rest of the story. They don't want you to hear. And so maybe, Ed, the reason you didn't fully understand the depths and the treatment of Africa, how African were being treated, because the 1619 Project didn't exist. Maybe because you were presented a white, whitewashed version of American history. So as opposed to uh, trying to throw shade at it, maybe you should spend some time reading that. Press play. With the settlement of Jamestown, the Massachusetts Bay Company, and they came primarily for, for profit and for gold. A little later, 
We know about Plymouth Rock when pilgrims came because they loved Jesus and they wanted to worship freely and independently in a new land. So a totally different ball game. But in Jamestown, the secular invasion of our country, they brought with them slaves, first slavery in our history. And then we know from that moment, listen, roughly 250 years, just hold on to that number, 250 years we treated fellow human beings made in the image of God as if they were animals and sometimes worse than we treat our own animals. Oh, I got to put a pause there, Ed, because, yes, slavery lasted about 243 years. You throw in the Civil War, then you got the Reconstruction period. Uh, but you might want to add on another 100 years, Ed. Uh, great Compromise of 1866. The election of 1876 leads to the Great Compromise of 1877, which leads to 92 years of Jim Crow. Black folks in Jim Crow were treated like animals were treated as less than human beings lynchings that took place in your home state of mississippi in south carolina where you were a pastor uh in alabama in tennessee in arkansas and texas and on and on and on so i'm trying to understand why you're only limiting this treatment of african americans to that period of slavery when that treatment existed beyond slavery when it was over, or as Douglas Blackman called it, slavery uh, without, uh, first of all, slavery without, sh it was slavery without shackles. Slavery continued, just weren't in shackles. Press play. It's the truth. The Constitution was written by wealthy men, intelligent men, supposedly God-fearing men, but eight out of the first. The Constitution was not written by wealthy men. It was written by wealthy white men. That distinction is kind of important to the conversation. Press play. First 12 presidents of the United States were slave owners. They were slave owners. Now you can be, build all kind of little anonymous how people treat their slaves like family and all that, but it is, it is brutality and is evil any way you look at it. And now we see Dr. King came I, I'm sorry. I, we, we went from slavery to Dr. King. Damn near a hundred years. Dr. King does not come onto the national consciousness until the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. He literally went from the end of slavery to Dr. King. How you skip 90 years? How, how do you skip Frederick Douglass? How, how do you skip Martin Delaney? How, how, how do you skip Booker T. Washington, W.B. Du Bois, A. Philip Randolph, Ida B. Wells Barnett. H how, do you how do you skip 90 years of black struggle for freedom and you just go, ooh, then we got Dr. King. Press play. And through prayer, he decided to bring about a revolution different from any other revolutions, except maybe when Mahatma Gandhi, through pacifism, liberated India from the British Empire through nonviolence. Dr. King took that path. It was dangerous, it was deadly, and he began through those years to do things, to say things, always in a biblical Christian context. Don't miss that. He began to say things and do things. Ed, can, can we name some of them? I mean, the way it sounds like Dr. King just prayed and gave sermons. No, that was policy. There were 
things behind that. He was arrested. There were protests, and it wasn't just him. It was Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. It was Dr. Dorothy Height. Uh, it was James Farmer. Uh, it was Core. It was SNCC. Uh, it was a plethora of individuals. Uh, it, it, it was, I mean, we can go, it was Ella Baker and others. It was Roy Wilkins. It was Whitney Young. I mean, we can go on and on with the folks who were involved in this. Come on, Doc. Press play. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. I submit to you that along with Billy Graham and maybe internationally Winston Churchill, Dr. Martin Luther King was the most influential individual in the 20th century. By far. But Ed, tell your white congregants why. Go deeper. Ed, come on. If you're going to walk through scripture, walk through the text and the life of Dr. King. Sitting right here, Ed. Seven volumes of Dr. King's writings. The papers of Martin Luther King Jr. from Stanford University, Claiborne Carson, and others. Seven volumes. And not even all of his papers. The books he read. Doc, you got to be, a, you got to go a little bit deeper than that player. Go ahead, press play. Far. He saved America. He, he preached the gospel. He was indeed a great man. Dr. King did not save America because he preached the gospel. Dr. King and others redefine America because they chose to stand up and fight for freedom and equality and fight against white supremacy, fight for the poor, fight for the folks who have been ignored. He didn't just preach the gospel. The Bible and says faith without works is dead. You can't stand before your congregation and give a sermon about Dr. King's faith and ignore his works and not mention that. But there's a reason why you don't want to mention his works. Because his works then contradicts what you believe today. Press play. Martin Luther King speaking at Southern Methodist University two years before his assassination, 1966. He said a doctrine of black supremacy is just as dangerous as a doctrine of white supremacy. God is not interested in freedom of black men or brown men or yellow men. God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race. The creation of a society where every man will respect the dignity and worth of personality. Dr. King, a couple of years before his assassination at SMU. Oh my God, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by Ed transitioning from Dr. King's work to a, a piece of his speech at Southern Methodist in 1966. So, so I decided to look up that particular speech. Go to my iPad. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a transcript of that particular speech. Uh, let me, Ed talked about the, the white supremacy, the black supremacy part. L let me scroll down. Let me keep going. 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 Oh, then I have arrived right there at the top of the screen, the one paragraph that Ed Young was speaking about. Ladies and gentlemen, the speech that Dr. King gave is 7,485 words. L let me say that again, just in case you missed what I just said. 
The speech that Dr. King gave at Southern Methodist University is 7,485 words. Ed Young skipped 6,345 words before he decided to cherry pick the segment of Dr. King's speech where he's talking about black supremacy. Now, if anybody understands and actually has read the history of Dr. King, what they will know and understand is Dr. King, whenever you saw him talking about black supremacy, he was specifically talking about the nation of Islam. He was talking about, if you, here's his book, Where We Go From Here, Chaos or Community. In this particular book, where he talked about that there are four institutions that are primed to liberate black America, he listed the Negro church, the Negro press, Negro fraternities and sororities, Negro professional and business organizations. And then he talks about the nation of Islam, and he says, while he praises them for the work that they have done to clean up black men and to be moral and upstanding, he disagrees with them about black supremacy. That's what he was talking about. In the same book, he talked about black power being an empty statement with nothing behind it. That's what King talked about. You can hear numerous speeches with him doing so. Uh, but see, but there's a reason why Ed mentioned while he just cherry picks that part of King's speech to, at SMU for this. So I submit to you that we're proud to be American. I'm proud to be American, but we can't overlook this disastrous history. At the same time, all important, the color of your face, says all of those in the woke agenda. What does that mean? That mean he said the woke agenda. Now you understand why he pulls out that segment on black supremacy because it is the setup for the attack on the woke agenda. He then tries to define the woke agenda. Press play. Means according to those in the left, left part of our United States, that if you were born black, or some other color that defines who you are, and you are, listen to me carefully, automatically a racist by being white. That is a fundamental and absolute lie. It is an absolute lie. That is not what being woke means. That is how white conservatives have redefined wokeness. They have used it as the attack against diversity, equity, and inclusion, the attack against multiculturalism, the attack against what we're trying to achieve, that's how they have redefined it in their own way that is not the definition. Press play. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you believe, where you've been, you are a racist by virtue of your birth, and more than that, and this is hard to believe, there's not a thing in the world you can ever do to repent and to convince anybody anywhere because you're white that you're not a racist. We all know that's a flat out lie. We've had Jane Elliott on this show. We've had Tim Wise on this show. We've had others on this show. We know that there are white brothers and sisters who are involved in the fight for equality. That is simply not true. We know for a fact James Reed was beaten to death. A pastor from Boston was beaten there uh, in Selma, uh, standing up for voting rights. We know white woman Viola Liuzzo from Michigan had her head blown off uh, coming back from Montgomery back to Selma. We know, uh, again, Again, the other white folks who were killed during the civil rights movement, and we know folk today who are involved in protests, who are on the front lines, who are not black. Sorry, Ed, you simply are wrong, and that's a flat out lie. But when you have your own definition of wokeness, now we understand why you were utterly confused. Hit play. There's no redemption. You can be anti racist, but you'll never reach the goal until you're still categorized like that. A leader of Black Lives Matter said, a matter of public record, anyone who waves an American flag by definition, whomever you are, you're a racist. 
Now, it's amazing how you could go go to find Dr. King's speech and go down 6,000 plus words and pluck out a paragraph, but you can't name who this so-called Black Lives Matter leader is. Do you have a name, Ed? Are they actually a Black Lives, Black Lives Matter leader? Who? Are they a local person? Are they a national leader? Who really is the person you're quoting, Ed, so we can have the context? Oh, you just say a Black Lives Matter leader, it's a matter of public record. Nice try. We ain't falling for the banana in the tailpipe. Press play. Everything is tragically defined by racism. How different that is from Dr. Martin Luther King's understanding of the racial challenges we had in America then, and we progressed a great deal, but we still have some ways to go, but how far that we have come. You see, he would tell us, as we know, the color of your face doesn't determine your character and who you are, and really, you'll discover, doesn't say much about you and me. Did you know that all of our physical assets, ears, nose, mouth, body, make up 0.012 of who we are? Is that any big deal about you or about me? That Color is all important of your skin? Uh. Did, did, did he just... Did, did, did. So, he, he, Dr. King didn't understand color? Dr. King didn't have an appreciation of blackness? Really, Ed? Dr. I recall Dr. King talking about black is beautiful. Press play. Dr. King. Go to Korea. I come Play here King. tonight and plead with you. Believe in yourself and believe that you're somebody. As I said to the group last night, nobody else can do this for us. No document can do this for us. No Lincolnian emancipation. Proclamation can do this for us. No Kennesonian or Johnsonian civil rights bill can do this for us. If the Negro is to be free, he must move down into the inner resources of his own soul and sign with a pen and ink of self-assertive manhood his own emancipation proclamation. Somebody said earlier tonight, we don't have anything to be ashamed of. Somebody told a lie one day. They couched it in language. They made everything black, ugly, and evil. Look in your dictionary and see the synonyms of the word black. It's always something degrading and low and sinister. Look at the word white. It's always something pure. Ah, but I want to get the language right tonight. I want to get the language so right that everybody he will cry out, yes, I'm black, I'm proud of it, I'm black and beautiful. What MLK says right there absolutely contradicts Ed Young. But I need you to understand what Young is doing. Young wants to present this sanitized, this civil rights mascot view of King. He wants to strip Dr. King of his radicalness. He wants to take it away and he wants to be somehow given credit for addressing the issue of race when no, what you're doing is you are actually ignoring what King's life was actually all about, the issues he actually confronted and dealt with. 
If y'all watch the rest of this sermon, what you hear, you will hear uh, Ed Young continuing and going on uh, talking about uh, uh, different aspects, uh, talking about how God created one race. Absolutely. Oh, he'll mention how race is a construct, and, and he'll talk about that uh, in a certain way. There's a certain point in his sermon where he talks about uh, how the white supremacists are almost out of business mentioning the KKK. Really? FBI Director Christopher Wray testified before Congress. Play it. This is the FBI Director talking in the last couple of years. Listen. The HVE threat, the homegrown violent extremist threat, is the new normal and it's created a new set of challenges. A much greater number of potential threats, each with far fewer dots to connect and much less time to prevent or disrupt an attack. These folks are largely radicalized online by the global jihadist movement. We're also keeping our eye on domestic terrorism from people who've come up with their own customized belief systems and hope to advance them through violence. We have, uh, through the uh, third quarter of this fiscal year, uh, had about give or take 100 arrests in the international terrorism side, which includes the homegrown violent extremism. This year. This year. But we've also had just about the same number, again, don't quote me to the exact digit, uh, on the domestic terrorism side. And I will say that a uh, majority of the um, domestic terrorism uh, cases that we've investigated uh, are motivated by some version of what you might call white supremacist violence, but it includes other things as well. It's a huge now, chunk. Now, Ed Young, this idea that somehow we've eliminated that simply flies out the window because it's simply not true. But when you're, li but when you're living in your own safe, protected cocoon, and when you are standing with MAGA folk, you actually believe that utter nonsense when in fact... That's simply not true. Play this part of his sermon. It's not biblical. Let me assure you of that. Because without grace, we're totally out of business. So, with that being said, I'm going to do something with great reticence. But I think it needs to be restated. One of the greatest orations, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, two or three others, would be Martin Luther King's I Had a Dream speech. There in the Washington Mall, maybe a million people present, millions of people heard it around the world. And Martin Luther King dreamed of a certain kind of America. I think we were getting there with not fast enough. 350 years of bigotry by leadership across the board is too much, folks. We can't deny that. We can't run from that. But we were getting there. And we're getting there because a lot of churches, Christians, that's how slavery got eliminated. In England, it was Wilberforce. And here, it was Uncle Tom's cabin. And here, it was... Henry Ward Beecher, and others who stood against the evil and deadliness of racism. Oh yes, it was through the church when people awakened to see that in the Bible we are one in Jesus Christ, period, Selah, when they began to preach that and see that, that's where racism was eliminated and still being healed. But thank God, there's only one kind of slave we want to be. And that's a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ where everybody... I got freeze right there. Ed, do you deny the reality of how the white church continued racism after slavery? How the Southern Baptist Convention, what they did? How, 
in, y'all, in his own sermon, he actually contradicts it by saying when he passed a church in South Carolina, they had a sign where everybody wasn't welcome. And he said, no, that's not how I'm going to be leading this church. Doc, come on. You can't sit here and talk about how the church was the, was the one that led the end of slavery. No, it was white men like John Brown who, who stood up against other white pastors who wanted to continue. Come on, Doc. We can't do that. And y'all, so you hear what he does. And so what he does is uh, he, he continues in here and then uh, he goes on and he closes his sermon by reciting King's I have a dream, the, portion, the I have a dream portion of King's speech. And see, this is the crux of what I'm talking about. See, this is what I'm talking about, the game that these white conservative preachers play in terms of how they love uh, to play around. See, Ed, since you want scripture, Proverbs 12, uh, uh, 17 said, a truthful witness gives honest testimony, but a false witness tells lies. Then it says, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. There is a deceit in the heart of those who plot evil, but joy for those who promote peace. Ed, you can't stand in front of the people and then recite the I have a dream portion of Dr. King's speech, but you ignore completely everything he said before that. You can't sit here and talk about, oh, how Dr. King wanted the races to get along and his children and what y'all he quote and he starts crying and, and, and his congregation begins to stand up and they begin to clap and cheer and all that begins to happen. But how dare you as a Christian pastor give a 26 minute sermon extolling Dr. King? Not one time do you talk about what he stood against. Not one time do you recite the same speech where he talked about police brutality. He talked about voter suppression. He talked about the economic imbalance in this country. How can you sit here and even quote that particular speech uh, that he gave at Southern Methodist University and totally look, look over the 6,000 other words he actually gave in the speech? Y'all, go to my iPad. If you actually look at the speech, Dr. King, in the speech, he talks about the poor. He talks about voter suppression, still alive today. He talks about the economic imbalance when it comes to wages and jobs. He talks about all of those things. Yet I don't hear Ed Young talking about any of these issues. I don't hear him talking about what King was referencing. I don't hear him t dealing with in all of these volumes the work King was talking about. Y'all go to YouTube. Ed Young has a speech called Socialism versus Capitalism, where he has some strong words against socialism. The same man who he praised in this sermon, guess what he called himself? A socialist. This book right here is called The Guaranteed Income. It is by Robert Theobald. This is the book, Reverend Al Sampson, who was one of two pastors personally ordained by Dr. King. This was the economic theory that the king believed in when it came to a guaranteed income. King said he was a socialist. But the same Ed Young has harsh words for socialists, yet he stands before the congregation, strips King of all of that to praise him, to make it sound like, oh, we all together. And if we could just love one another and just stand together, no, Ed, what it requires is for you to put some skin in the game. What it requires for you, Ed, is to not be, uh, not to drive your conservative uh, theories when you at your church hosted Roy Moore Jr. when he was running against Doug Jones in the Alabama Senate. When you stood there and criticized the cash bail situation, blaming that for crime in the country, when you don't want to confront mass incarceration, where are you, Ed Young, with the Poor People's Campaign and Reverend Dr. William J. Barber fighting for the 140 million poor and low income folks in the country? You can't stand before the people and praise Dr. King and never mention the poor. You can't stand there and talk about how great and wonderful he was when literally the things that that man was fighting for then are still exist today. 
You can't sit here and strip this man of who he was and how he spoke against the reality of how white folks thought. But you know, maybe I just ought to just share just a couple of things and I'm almost done. And I'm gonna let the panelists comment and then I'm gonna go to my next guest. But I, I just want y'all to understand that, um, yeah, uh, th this is what King wrote. White Americans left the, left the Negro on the ground and in devastating numbers walked off with the aggressor. It appeared that the white segregationists and the ordinary white citizen had more in common with one another than either had with the Negro. Same MOK. Uh, the same MOK, this is what he said. Overwhelmingly, America is still struggling with ir 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 irresolution and contradiction. It has been sincere and even ardent in welcoming some change, but too quickly apathy and disinterest rise to the surface when the next logical steps are to be taken. Laws are passed in a crisis mood after a Birmingham or a Selma, but no substantial fervor survives the formal signing of legislation. The recording of the law in itself is treated as the reality of the reform. Same MOK, Ed Young. MOK writes, the real cost lies ahead. The stiffening of white resistance is a recognition of that fact. The discount education given Negroes will in the future have to be purchased at full price if quality education is to be realized. Jobs are harder and costlier to create than voting rolls. The eradication of slums housing millions is complex far beyond integrating buses and lunch counters. Same MOK. Same MOK. He then says in here, Negroes have proceeded from a premise that equality means what it says, and they have taken white Americans at their word when they talked of it as an objective. But most whites in America in 1967, including many persons of goodwill, proceed from a premise that equality is a loose expression for improvement. White America is not even psychologically organized to close the gap. Essentially, it seeks only to make it less painful and less obvious, but in most respects to retain it. Most of the abrasions between Negroes and white liberals arise from this fact. Same MLK, Ed Young. Same one. Then he says, whites, it must frankly be said, are not putting in a similar mass effort to re-educate themselves out of their racial ignorance. It is an aspect of their sense of superiority that the white people of America believe they have little to learn, y'all. That's just in the first 10 pages of the book. I take exception to the sermon because what Ed Young is doing is what white Christians and white, white Republicans often do. That is, they want to present a sanitized, clean, saccharine, G-rated version of Dr. King minus all of the stuff that he was fighting for in his 39 years. You can't stand before your congregation, Ed Young, and praise Dr. King and how wonderful he was and how he preached the gospel if you never even mention the word poor. You can't stand there in your fine sanctuary and talk about how amazing he was and, and how he changed America if you're unwilling to commit yourself to the very things that he actually stood for. Because frankly, all you're doing, if you don't, is providing us with empty rhetoric that is meaningless. If Pastor Ed Young Sr. wants to impress me, I dare you to invite Reverend Dr. William J. Barber to your church. I dare you to invite the Poor People's Campaign and Repairs of the Breach. I dare you, Ed Young, to hold a one or two day conference on your campus with regards to the real life of Dr. King. I, I, I dare you to bring Reverend Bernice King to your church and the King Center and have a real dialogue. I dare you, Ed Young, to invite Reverend William Lawson and Reverend Dr. Uh, Ralph West and other pastors in Houston, the other black pastors in Houston to come and say how you, Ed Young, are willing to stand with them on the very issues that Dr. King talked about. Don't sit here and cherry pick out of a soul speech he gave at SMU if you're unwilling to address the other 
stuff he talked about in the very speech. Please, Ed Young, show me where you called out Senator Tommy Tuberville for his racist comments. Please show me where you have chastised Donald Trump, other Republicans for their racist and xenophobic comments. Please show me where you are willing in, at, the, at the age of 86 to stand in the same spot and say, I'm willing to lift up the same stuff Dr. King believed in. If not, all you did was give yourself a 26 minute pat on the back, shed some tears at the end and got you an empty standing ovation from your audience and they left that church just as uninformed as they were when you started. It's simple as that. Uh, Monique, you said, I'm gonna let you start. You sent me a text saying you heard the speech and uh, you had views on it. You agreed with most of it. Uh, now that you heard me lay this out, you can go ahead and comment. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know that there's ever been a single topic about which we've disagreed more. Um, I, I believe, as you said, on my show a couple of days ago that it's the responsibility of um, white people in leadership to speak and galvanize in, in their own uh, communities and, and, and thereby congregations. And I see someone like a pastor, Ed Young, uh, with roughly 85,000 people well. um, in, in his ministry. Uh, who chose, didn't have to, ain't no special day, not MLK day or nothing like that, chose the topic of racism and the history of slavery and racism in this country to spend the entirety of his sermon um, and, and talked about slavery and the hundreds of years post-slavery and the the hideous actions of the founders of this country and of those who led our country for hundreds of years thereafter. He mentioned a part that, that was not included in, in what you covered, um, that he is not opposed to even legislation that promotes equality. Uh, he discussed um, the areas in which he thought personally he had been able to assist, such as going in and leading a church that had been led by racists and white supremacists and needing to reach agreement with leadership and the leadership voting and a little more than half of them agreeing so that he could continue there. But the governor, who was a deacon being one who did not agree, um, all of these stories are documented. But um, to me, the thousands of people in that church that day uh, likely heard more about the plight of black people in this country from a leader they respect than they had heard in days and days and years and years. He made no mention they, about they plight. They may be looking at. They he may be. He made no mention about plight. At, he didn't talk about. Why are you interrupting? No, I'm interrupting because he made no mention of plight. He didn't talk about economics. Okay. He talked about education. Okay. He didn't do present day. Okay. No, he didn't. He simply was a flyover. He spoke at thirty thousand feet. Okay. He literally made no specific mention about the condition of African Americans then or now, other than we were treated as animals. He simply did not. Right. Except and except saying that we've come a long way, but we have further to go. Well, can, well, can you that, say what we might want to be doing? No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not saying that he gave an anthology. I'm not saying um, okay. that he gave an accurate history of, of slavery in America and the vestiges of it. I'm not I, I, saying I, I, I'm not, that I'm he not gave even an focused on slavery. I'm not even focused no, on slavery. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm he, not saying he, he that he gave an accurate. He wouldn't even mention a single substantive issue that the king fought. All he said was he preached the gospel and changed the world. Well, that, that's as it. you say, as you as you say, it's your show. Um, no, as I opinion, say, it's called context. <laughs> no, but but you keep. I know, but you had twenty minutes. I'm only trying to take four. Well, actually, actually, actually I, I, I got you. But but okay. first of all, I, but you've had three and a half, and so to, okay. I, no, but no, but you had three and a half. So I'm gonna go to Robert. Got then I'm gonna it. go to Joe. But you did, uh, Robert. Go. Uh, well, you know, I appreciate the the effort, uh, 
Uh, there's a, a meme going around, at least she tried. And I think that for many of these white people, as, uh, as Monique said, this may be their first introduction to even the concept, particularly when you can see nothing but white ring, well, white ring, uh, white wing media um, 24-7. Uh, and so maybe within 10 percent of the congregation will inspire them to go home and do a Google search and find out the full context and find out the deeper meaning, uh, to dive deeper into it, to think of themselves differently. Uh, I think that any conversation conversation on has to be uh, the beginning, but we have to keep it going after, uh, thereafter. What we've seen in the last 50 years or so is I call the Disneyfication of Dr. King, where they've taken the Dr. King that actually existed and turned him into this cartoon character uh, that they can kind of trot out uh, whenever they, they need to. They usually take the I Have a Dream speech, for example, that was 1,667 words, and they just say, content of character, color of the skin, and that's all they know of the speech. So it's important for us, the people who do understand, who do know, to call these things out, to make people understand that the uh, that these individuals were more than just the uh, a tagline or a hashtag or a meme, uh, that there was deeper uh, uh, work that was being done, and that the entire civil rights movement wasn't just Dr. King, as uh, Chris Rock said, that that's all we learned of Martin Luther King, that there were hundreds of thousands of people who fought and thousands who died and were imprisoned and lost everything for the journey that we are on, and those uh, are going to be turned back in the upcoming years by the Supreme Court. So it's an important conversation to begin, now that it has begun, maybe this is where we step in and partner in and walk in and say, well, let me give you some more context. So let's bring some black ministers, uh, Reverend Barber or Reverend Sharpton or uh, Reverend Jackson in his younger days to give the full context on what happened and start building those bridges between the two. Uh, so I will give him an A for effort. Uh, but I do think, as you said, Roland, there's a lot more context that needs to be put in there, a lot more education that needs to be had. But we need to at least begin the conversation since many of these people are, are, are so recalcitrant to the uh, idea of being even presented presented right. that they're storming school boards to talk critical race theory. Well, Joe, what you're not going to do is try to throw shade at the 1619 Project, Black Lives Matter, and woke agenda. Uh, we don't know what the hell you're talking about, but then you want to cover it up by saying, oh, I love Dr. King. Joe, go ahead. You know, I think one of the scriptures that is mentioned in that same speech uh, by Dr. King uh, is Amos 5 and 4, and a lot of people know the scripture, us church folk know the scripture. It says, but let justice roll down like a river and righteousness as an ever flowing stream. But there was a but. So what had happened before was the what had happened was people had been making the sacrifices that they normally did. Oh, let's kill an animal. Oh, let's do the things that we normally do, God, and it will pacify you. But what God was saying was what you used to do and what you're doing now isn't enough. So let justice roll down like a river. You know, if there was this uh, uh, this hypocrisy and this uh, selective memory and this self-righteousness, frankly, despite the effort, um, some may call it effort, uh, this is the reasons non-Christians won't become Christians. Got it. And I'm a Christian saying it. And so, really, Martin was called a militant. Ask him. Let's ask Pastor how he felt about Martin when he died. He's old enough to be around. Was he actually reciting the words from I Have a Dream back in 1963? I bet you he wasn't. Does he have a picture of Jesus that is historically accurate visually today? Probably not. It might be that some people in his congregation, if they saw Jesus as Jesus was to be seen in the natural, they wouldn't even be followers. And so, therefore, we are at a place where we have to be truthful. And even the Bible says, 2 Thessalonians 10, people have not a love of the truth. For that reason, they'll be sent strong delusion to believe the lie. At the end of the day, regardless of his effort, regardless of his intention, and in fact, I don't have a heaven or hell to put him in, and he might get the same grace that I'm in need. I know he needs it. But at the end of the day, he was wrong, and he was wrong from the pulpit, and he's aligned with Donald Trump who calls 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians, he's aligned right. with fascism, and he's he, he's aligned with, with a lack of truth. Going to truth will make people uncomfortable. Everybody celebrates Martin right. as if he lived a long life and they didn't kill him, but they did. Well, and again, all I'm simply saying is uh, if you're going to cherry pick the black supremacy part, don't ignore the other 6,000 plus words of what he laid out. But it's amazing how that's the only part of the speech 
he referenced. All right, folks, back to our Roland Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. Welcome to Atlanta, one of the most expensive housing markets in America. But rather than help out, Brian Kemp cashed in. He made hundreds of thousands of dollars in real estate. His net worth skyrocketed. And while Atlantans struggled to stay in their homes, Kemp gave $10,000 tax handouts to the richest Georgians and a nearly $700 million no-bid contract to his campaign donor. Brian kicked back Kemp, making Georgia work for him, not you. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?